So the gospel, uh, it's quite a, quite a large topic. Um, it's such a huge part of our, of our lives um, and our commission, right? It's, it's what we're all about. Um, the whole idea of, of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, that um, it's our hope and we're constrained to preach to it to others. Um, it's something that should fill our lives. Um, we quite often describe it with the expression from Acts chapter 12, or chapter 8, sorry. Um, and in Acts 8, there we go. Um, if you would just turn there. This is where we usually get our definition of the gospel from. Acts 8 and chapter 12. Sorry, Acts 8 and verse 12. Philip was preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, and they were baptized both men and women. So, um, we believe then that this message, very soon Jesus will return to this earth and set up God's kingdom, and he will accept into that kingdom all who have called upon his name, upon the name of Christ. Um, but the gospel appears in the Bible quite a variety of expressions as I was sort of going through this in preparation for this study. Um, and we'll go through those in more detail. But I just made up a little uh, table here. So these are a few of the expressions um, that they, the gospel appears in. And we'll go, yeah, we'll, we'll just sort of skim through this fast if you want to write them down. I can give you the verses later. Um, but yeah, gospel of the kingdom, gospel of Christ, Gospel of God, grace of God, glory of Christ, gospel of salvation, gospel of peace, new covenant, the mystery of the gospel is an interesting one we'll hopefully um, spend some time on. And then there's also many analogies to the, go- the gospel as compared to a mustard seed, um, to leaven, to the pearl of great price, um, and so on in some of Jesus' parables. So each of these aspects of the gospel could really I think, be a class in itself. So obviously, just in one class, we won't be able to do any of them justice, and we'll just have to do a quick overview. Um, But we'll also try and do something a little bit different, maybe look at the gospel in a different, maybe in a bit of a different way than we usually usually do, Um, because the gospel is, in general, viewed as like a New Testament sort of thing. Um, And certainly it is. I mean, Jesus, obviously the name of Jesus Christ. But... There was an interesting verse in the passage we had read tonight. So if, if we could just go back to that again in Romans chapter 1. <clears throat> Romans chapter 1 and verse 2. It says, Set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his Son, who is descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God, in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. So, it's saying there that the gospel was preached beforehand, um, before Christ, through the prophets. So who were these prophets that preached it? Which um, which ones? And and was it just the prophets, or were other people in the Old Testament in tune with the gospel as we know it, and as Jesus preached it? Well, I think one of the first prophets in the Old Testament, is Enoch. Um, So Enoch was obviously before uh, the flood, but if you, um, in Jude, Jude 1 and verse 14, it says that Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints um, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So um, Enoch was prophesying, and he even named his son Methuselah. Um, Methuselah means man of the arrow. And so in this case, I think, I think arrow is referring to like coming judgment. And indeed, Methuselah died. Um, when Methuselah died, the year, the year he died was when the flood came on the earth. Um, and so the gospel is, is part of that is judgment, right? Um, if God doesn't um, judge the wicked, then he can't save the righteous. Um, 
in the gospel of the glory of Christ is Christ coming back to this earth as a lion, as a king, um, in, in judging his adversaries, um, avenging the righteous, and ultimately setting up God's kingdom. God's purpose, in fact, to fill the earth with his glory couldn't be realized if he didn't get rid of those who didn't agree with, with his things and blasphemed against his name in order for his purpose to be fulfilled. So I think Enoch, in this sense, was prophesying the gospel even before the flood. Obviously, you can't talk about the flood with also, without also mentioning Noah in that as well. Um, let's, turn, let's turn this one up. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. If you could turn there. 2 Peter 2 and verse 5. It says there, And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. Um, so Noah, he preached the gospel through his actions, right? He showed um, his conviction and faith through that massive ark that he constructed. Every time someone saw the ark, they could obviously see that Noah was absolutely convinced in God's word because he put that much time and effort into building this massive uh, construction. Um, quick little aside here, I think you would have seen that verse, Noah's called a preacher of righteousness. That's quite a title. I think, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's the only place, the only person in the Bible that that specific title is used of, a preacher of righteousness. Um, so what does that make you think of when you hear that? Well, for me at least, um, made me think of someone like who was a charismatic, convincing speaker. He had lots of good arguments. He could talk to people about the Bible and bring like tons of people into the truth, right? But Noah, he only brought seven other people with him onto the ark, and they were all his family. Um, so I think that's sort of encouraging for us in many ways. Um, Noah was given this title, Preacher of Righteousness, even though he only managed to save his family. So we don't need to be too discouraged when other people don't listen to our preaching, as long as we try. And Noah certainly did try. He spent a hundred years building that ark and telling people about his faith just to get turned down and ignored by the, everybody else who was alive at that time. Um, at, least, at least for us in this day... Um, we have the hope that maybe if we have planted that seed in someone's heart, that even after Christ returns and sets up God's kingdom, that person, the, the seed might, um, they might remember back what, to what we said and be convinced of it, and they could live as a mortal in the kingdom. But Noah, he knew that every person that he didn't convince to bring out into that ark was going to be swept away in the flood and die forever. Um, so we at least have that bit of encouragement to, to encourage us to, to preach. And it also, I think, shows that the best preaching that you can do is sometimes those that are closest to you. Because um, if Noah was given that title just for saving his family, then I think that shows that developing relationship, relationships with people who we preach to is very important, and it's a very important preaching tool. So I think there's two examples of the gospel being shown even before the flood, Enoch and Noah. Um, prophesying and, and preaching to others. And this is even before that God had um, chosen Israel as his chosen people. Okay, the next one that came to my mind after the flood um, was Abraham. Uh, sorry. There we go. Okay. Um, so let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 6. It reads there, <clears throat> um, Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted him to, to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, 
in you are all the nations of the earth blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So there you go. The gospel was preached to Abraham even before there was an, a Jewish nation. Um, and also further down in verse 14 there in the same chapter, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Um, so that's us. We're, we're um, given a part of Abraham's blessings and um, through Jesus Christ and through the gospel. <clears throat> so, even though sometimes people think of the Old Testament as being exclusive to the Jews and God is not interested in anyone else, he's chosen them as his people and that's all that he cared about, um, we have there proof that the gospel was preached salvation for everyone through, through Abraham, um, Jews and Gentiles alike through, Je through Jesus Christ and through his name. Also, even though there isn't much said about it in the record, I think there's evidence that preaching was very important to Abraham and just a natural way of his life. I think it's something that he did every day. Um, turn with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 14. Let's see some of the events in Abraham's life and where he, he preached the gospel to others. <clears throat> so this is the account of when um, the king of Sodom is attacked by the confederate armies of the five kings. So Genesis 14, starting in verse 8. And the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is Zor, went out and joined together in battle in the valley of Shittim against Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of nations, Amraphel, king of Shinar, and Arioch, king of Elassar, four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and some fell there, and the remainder fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions, and went their way. They also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. Then one who escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth trees of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshahol and brother of Ashner. And they were allies with Abram. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and all his goods, as well as the women and the people. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shaba, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of, Mo of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Now the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say I have made Abram rich. Okay, so there is the account um, of Abraham in faith going and attacking a much superior host. Um, sorry. Um, and the, fir the first thing I wanted to, um, that came to my mind was the fact that Abram had over 300 trained servants capable of fighting, and so therefore he would have had a lot more you know, women, children, and, and elderly in his camp. Um, and these servants had the faith to follow him into a battle, Against, uh, against five kings. Like, they're just one family, and they're going out and fighting five kings. I mean, they must have shared the same conviction and belief in God. Otherwise, they would think they're just throwing their lives away, like they, they would have deserted the army or whatever. Um, unless these, uh, these servants were unnaturally courageous or talented soldiers, um, there's no way they would have had the courage to, to go and enter into a situation like that. So Abram must have convinced these people of the same 
belief that he had. And that's sort of like Noah, the, the idea of preaching those closest to you. Abram obviously had this relationship with, with all his servants that he managed to almost make them family. Um, also, if you look there in, in verse um, 19, when he comes back from defeating Chedorlaomer and the alliance of kings, um, he's greeted as Abram of the Most High God by Melchizedek. So Abram must not have been quiet about his faith um, if he was known by others as Abram of the Most High God. It was clearly something that he was not afraid to tell people about. And then further on in verse 22, Abram says to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God Most High. So, I mean, this, it just came into his, his daily conversation. He was happy to tell people that, you know, that's why I did that. That's, give credit to God for, um, for what he accomplished through me. And he was totally open about his beliefs. <coughs> Sorry, I think that was supposed to be up there before. <laughs> Okay, and then there's the verse, um, yeah, where Abram, Abram declares his faith in God. <clears throat> okay, and then, um, sorry, just a bit lost here. Okay, the other way I think Abram might have preached in his life is through hospitality. If we assume that the incident of where, you know, where the three angels come to his camp, and he assumes they're just travelers or strangers, and he invites them in and gives them food and everything. We assume that's not an isolated incident. This is probably how Abram dealt with any stranger that came along. He didn't know that those three men were angels, right? And I'm sure once he invited people into his camp, he would have taken every opportunity to tell them about his beliefs and his conviction. And then the final example... Um, we won't, we won't turn it up, but you all know the story of where the angel is talking to him about Sodom. And, and Abraham is trying to um, bargain with the angel and try and save Sodom, right? So Abram's initial guess is that, well, there, surely there's at least 50 righteous people left in the city. And then obviously it goes down from there as Abraham gets more and more desperate. Um, but if Abram thought that there would be at least 50 people from Lot's preaching even though he knew what a wicked city Sodom was. Um, and obviously he wouldn't have expected any more from Lot than he would have from himself in terms of preaching the gospel. Then, um, then obviously Abram would have, would have done the same. It wouldn't make any sense to him why you wouldn't. Like Abram knew who God was. God, God spoke to him. Um, it must have been so frustrating for, for Abraham. Um, trying to convey that conviction to others because he knew for absolute surety like God had spoken to him directly and then, but when he told others about it they wouldn't believe him um, we think it's frustrating and we try to explain to people from the Bible um, but if people don't believe in the Bible then sometimes they're not convinced whereas Abram would have taken it personally if someone said they didn't believe him that God had spoken to him like he would have thought they were calling him a liar right? it would have been very frustrating for him so Hopefully that's, um, that's a character in Scripture that we can take an example from, from his, his conviction and earnestness. And there's a number we could also look at. There's a few, um, like the rest of the patriarchs. Joseph, for example, preached in prison. Um, there's an example of Gentiles being included in Israel with uh, Rahab being brought into the, into the camp. Um, and then obviously Ruth. David was certainly inclusive. Uh, many of his mighty men were foreigners who were brought into the hope of Israel. But let's move to the time of Solomon, because I think Solomon gives a really interesting, uh, really interesting prayer. If you want to turn to 1 Kings chapter 8. And this is Solomon's prayer for the dedication of the temple. First Kings verse 8, sorry, chapter 8 and verse 41. <clears throat> says Solomon's praying he says moreover concerning a foreigner who is not of your people Israel but has come from a far country for your name's sake for they will hear of your great name and your strong hand and your outstretched arm 
when he comes and prays toward this temple, hear in heaven your dwelling place and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, that all peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this temple which I have built is called by your name. So there you go. Um, you can see here from this, from Solomon's prayer, that he totally understood the gospel. He understood that God's purpose was to reach out to all other nations. He said, just as um, your people Israel do, um, listen to this foreigner who prays to your temple. <clears throat> and and um, obviously Saul, Solomon then knew that God's purpose was to fill the earth with his glory. And to do that, he needed more than just the nation of Israel. He needed the Jews and the Gentiles. And Solomon had people coming from all over the earth to hear of his wisdom, right? He had the Queen of Sheba come from the south. And it says that um, many other kings of nations brought gifts and stuff to Solomon and came to hear his wisdom. So he would have no doubt taken that opportunity to not only tell him of his wisdom of natural things, but also of spiritual things, and to share his knowledge of God. Um, the evidence of this, I think, we can see um, when he speaks to the Queen of Sheba. So if you want to, uh, want to turn over to 1 Kings chapter 10, we can see this, the account of the Queen of Sheba. <clears throat> Just a couple pages over. 1 Kings 10, um, and we'll start in verse 8. So this is, a, this is after the Queen of Sheba has met Solomon, and she's so impressed by all his wisdom and the way he runs his kingdom. She says in verse 8, Happy are your men, and happy are these your servants, who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God, who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel. Because the Lord has loved Israel forever, therefore he made you king to do justice and righteousness. <clears throat> so the Queen of Sheba here seems to show quite an understanding of God. Um, she talks about she talks to him quite comfortably. And so I think it's a good indication that Solomon must have told her quite a lot about him. Otherwise, how would she know these things? So there's many other um, examples in the kings and the prophets. And even, um, even this morning, we talked about in the, in the exhortation, that little maidservant that was mentioned to preach the gospel to Naaman. Um, and the, these people all understood that the gospel and that the hope of Israel could be extended to the Gentiles. They weren't blind to that. But the next one we'll skip to is the example of Jeremiah. <clears throat> so, um, let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 31. I think Jeremiah is a very interesting example. He um, certainly didn't have an easy go with with his preaching. <laughs> he, um, he was ignored by everyone. He was... Um, really, really must have been hard for him to see some positives in, in what he was in his preaching and the message he was giving. But let's read um, Jeremiah 31 and verse 31. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So what's the new covenant? Well, the new covenant is through Christ, right? It's the gospel. It's the, I, the idea that Israel wouldn't be saved through the law, it would be saved through grace and through Jesus. And that, certainly, um, as we've seen before, was able to be extended to the Gentiles and to us. Uh, sorry. That's the verse there. <clears throat> and I think Jeremiah is, is such a fantastic example of, of preaching. Um, He's so persistent in what he says. Um, like, if we think that we have it hard when we're preaching, you know, we're afraid of people not accepting what we say or ridiculing us, um, <laughs> Jeremiah must have, must have had one of the toughest goes in the entire Bible. Like, just his whole life, he was constantly ridiculed, ignored, he was abused, he was thrown in prisons and dungeons and pits and all the rest of it. Um, and it was from his own people as well. Like, it's one thing to receive hand at, receive this sort of abuse at the hand of strangers and people that you'd expect it from. But if it was his own people that he loved and cared for and he was just trying to reach out to them and save their lives, it must have been, it must have been so discouraging. I mean, think of it for ourselves. If the people that you loved and, and cared about treated you like that, I mean, it's, 
it's terrible, obviously, to think about. And Jeremiah actually goes on to tell us what it made him feel like. If you want to turn over um, to Jeremiah 15, just back a few pages. <clears throat> Jeremiah 15 and verse 10. He sounds quite depressed, and he says, Woe is me, my mother, that you have borne me, a man of strife and contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent for interest, nor have men lent to me for interest, yet every one of them curses me. Wow, that must, that's got to be the ultimate depths of despair. Um, not only is Jeremiah depressed with how things are now, he can't even see any good at any time in his life. He wishes he wasn't born. He, he then goes on to say, in verse 10 there, um, that he feels like he's brought conflict upon and annoyed the entire nation. He feels like everybody in the world is against him. And then he says that maybe he could understand why people would treat him like this if perhaps, you know, he had been, as he says, I've neither lent for interest nor have men lent to me for interest. So if he was part of a financial deal, maybe that went wrong or if he had... If he owed people's money and hadn't paid them back or something, he could understand why people would be mad at him. But he hadn't wronged any of them. All he had done was preach God's word. And they still treated him like that. Um, and then in verse 15 there, he says, O Lord, you know, remember me and visit me, and take vengeance on me of my persecutors. And your enduring patience do not take me away. Know that for your sake I have suffered rebuke. So he's earnestly praying to God um, to help him, to, to not turn away from him, not turn his back on him, because he feels like everybody else has. And then um, this is the incident that is pictured in the background, well, <laughs> could be um, representative of what Jeremiah went through. In Jeremiah 38 uh, is the account of one of the, must have been one of the worst experiences of that Jeremiah had to go through. Um, Jeremiah 38 and verse 6. He was preaching to the king um, and to the people and decided to get rid of him. And in verse 6 it says, So they took Jeremiah and cast him into the dungeon of Melchiah, the king's son, which was in the court of the prison. And they let Jeremiah down with ropes. And in the dungeon there was no water but mire. So Jeremiah sank in the mire. Um, so maybe this, this would have been similar to the view Jeremiah had from that deep, dark pit. You could see the, the light and the freedom at the top, um, but it would have looked so far away for him, so unreachable, as he sank into the cold, um, the cold, dark, filthy muck that he was in. And I'm sure Jeremiah would have wondered if he would ever have got out of there, ever been able to see that light of day again. Um, as he knew no, that he had no friends, no one, to, no one to bring him out. And it wasn't an ordinary dungeon either. Um, it was a sewer, right? It, it says that Jeremiah was thrown into this thing. Um, he was sinking in sewage. Like, you don't even want to think about how disgusting and unbearable that would be. Not only is he confined in that place, he's up to his armpits or whatever in, in sewage. Um, Jeremiah actually ends up begging the king later not to be sent back because he thinks if he spends any more time in there, he'll die. It was that bad. So if persecution wasn't enough, it also, for Jeremiah, seemed like all his efforts were in vain. Everybody ignored him. Let's turn uh, back a few pages to Jeremiah 20. Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 7. <clears throat> Hmm, I think that's the wrong passage there. Uh, <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. I've just started halfway through the verse, I think. Um, yeah, that's right. Thanks, Brother Steve. <laughs> it says, um, in another translation that I have here, I've become a laughing stock all the day. Everyone mocks me. For whenever I speak, I cry out, I shout violence and destruction, for the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and derision all the day long. So imagine enduring all the things that Jeremiah went through when he thought it was all in vain anyway, and no one would get any benefit from it. It must have been so discouraging for him. Um, 
you would think, what's the point? You know, at least for us, if our preaching falls on deaf ears, we still have a comfortable home to go, to go back to. We still live in a, in a prosperous country. Um, we don't have too many, we're not at least being threatened or attacked daily like Jeremiah was, um, and constantly fearing for our lives. But there is a glimmer of hope for Jeremiah. Um, he could see that light at the top of the cistern. Um, and uh, if you want to turn, turn with me to Jeremiah 24, um, he has that hope that maybe some people would benefit from what he was saying. Jeremiah 24, starting at verse 5. Um, it says, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Like those good figs, so will I acknowledge those who are carried away captive from Judah, whom I have set, sent out of this place for their own good, unto the land of the Chaldeans. For I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. Then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they will return to me with their whole heart. So Jeremiah, this must have been very encouraging for him, because he felt like maybe all this hardship that he was going through could, bring, could accomplish some good. So who are these good figs, um, and why were they taken away? Well, it says here that they were taken away so that um, they could give the people of Israel hope to come back to the land. And also to preach the gospel, right? Because they would be a light to all the nations they went to. Um, people would see God's power displayed through their lives. Uh, through the way they lived their lives and stood apart from things like Daniel and his three friends, people would have seen that there must have been something else to them. There must have been something working in them in their lives. And saved them like, from certain death, like um, when he saved them from the burning fiery furnace and from the lion's den. So then God would also put them in the right places and give them the right authority um, in their place of captivity so that they could save the nation and bring them back. So Jeremiah's preaching may not have been in vain after all. Um, and these good figs would have listened to Jeremiah before they were taken away. I'm sure Daniel and his friends would have known of Jeremiah's prophesying and his teaching. And they wouldn't have scorned him like the rest of the nation. And then when they were taken away, they would have seen Jeremiah's words come to pass. And maybe that's what convinced them to be as strong as they were when they were in captivity. If they saw Jeremiah's prophecies be completed, they would have known that God was the true God. And that um, it, was, he, it was his will for them to go into captivity. And not that he was too weak to save them. Um, and so they wouldn't have been swayed by the nation's, other nations' gods because they would have had that conviction. So it's quite possible um, that Jeremiah's prophecy would have at least been partially responsible for um, Daniel and his three friends keeping the faith and for others too, right? Like es Esther and Nehemiah or Mordecai. Um, they saved the Jewish population. Um, Ezra, when he came back, rebuilding the temple. Nehemiah, um, leaving his position as king's cupbearer and coming back to restore the wall in the city. So these are massive positives. Um, at the time, Jeremiah would have thought that it was also hopeless and he would have been discouraged, no one was listening. But if he had been able to look back and seen what happened um, in hindsight, he would have realized that his prophesying might have been responsible for saving the entire nation. If it wasn't for those people being in those positions, then... Um, then they, they, well, obviously God would have worked, worked out, but he worked through those people to accomplish his will and bring the nation back. So, you never know that, you know, if that little preaching that you do, even if it seems like it's falling on, on hard, compact ground, um, it might have huge effects down the road. <clears throat> okay, so, I think that sort of covers a few of the Old Testament characters that... Um, preach the gospel. So now I want to try and take a bit of a different track and look at some of the different expressions that we saw in that chart um, and see how the gospel is explained through those. Um, so first is the gospel of the grace of God. And we'll, go, we'll try and go through these pretty quickly just for the sake of time. Um, <clears throat> but let's turn over to Acts chapter 20. 
That's where this expression is used. Acts 20 and verse 24. It says, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my race with joy in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And you don't have to turn this one up, but there's also a passage in Ephesians uh, 3 verse 2. It says, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me, you word. So, how is the gospel the grace of God? Um, well, I think it's because it's all about how God has given all of us salvation and the hope of eternal life, um, even though we definitely didn't deserve it, right? He, he gave us that when we were still sinners and condemned to death. Um, and it's the gift of, the gracious gift of God that we have a hope of eternal life. Um, it's very much actually like the example of Naaman that we talked about in the exhortation this morning. Um, he didn't deserve to be healed well, in that sense, right? Like he, he didn't even believe in God. He believed in um, his god Rimen or whatever it was back in Syria. Um, he, he slaughtered people for a living. He, was, um, he even raided Israel and took away that little girl captive. Um, but because Naaman humbled himself and asked for God's help and listened to the maidservant, God showed grace to him, um, extended grace to him and saved him just like God has done for every one of us in giving us the gospel. <clears throat> the next expression is the gospel of the glory of God. Um, and this occurs in 1 Timothy 1. First Timothy 1, verse 11. It reads, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. The gospel of the glory of the blessed God, in another translation. <clears throat> also, uh, you don't have to turn this one on, I got it on the screen, but 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. Um, well, I'll start, at verse, I'll start at verse 4, actually. It says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For as we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So it talks about the glory of God, and it says that when we allow God to work with us, um, his glory shines through us. And if you want to turn to, um, turn to, sorry, turn to 2 Corinthians 4, um, Paul later says, um, <clears throat> Paul says that, that this treasure that he's given us, this ability to manifest God in our lives and for others to see his glory in us, is in earthen vessels. So he's saying that we're still, so we're still mortal and still human, so people can tell that it's not through our power that we're doing this. Um, God is working through us, and so people see that, and God is glorified in their sight. Let's turn over to Isaiah 60, um, back in the Old Testament, because I think this is a, an excellent prophecy of, of the Gospel. Another example of where we see it being displayed in the Old Testament. Isaiah 16, verse 2 says, <clears throat> For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness, is darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, the kings to the brightness of your rising. So it's the gospel of the glory of God because God's glory will fill the whole earth when the Jew and Gentile alike are redeemed um, and given eternal life and manifest God perfectly. And in that way, God will be glorified. <clears throat> the next one is the gospel of the kingdom of God. Let's turn uh, quickly to Matthew 24. Matthew 24 and verse 14 
says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Also, uh, Matthew says back in, in chapter 4, he says, And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. So, I think we're pretty familiar with this, obviously. The, the gospel is the, about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, and Micah also prophesied of this. Micah chapter 4 and verse 1 says, And it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and it shall be lifted up above the hills, and all people shall flow to it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we might walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So it's the gospel of the kingdom, because that's God's ultimate purpose with the earth, um, to bring about his kingdom and to have everybody be a part of that. <clears throat> the gospel of peace is the next one. Um, in Romans 10, verse 15, it says, And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it's written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. So how is it the gospel of peace? What is that about the gospel? Well, I think Paul explains this just back a few verses in verse 12. He says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord is over all that call upon him. So there's no reason for fighting... Um, Sorry. There's no reason for fighting between any of the nations because they're all one in Christ, right? Um, so they should be at all at peace with each other if they, if they followed Christ. Um, and this, I think, is, is, is prophesied by Isaiah. If you want to just turn over to um, Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice, from that time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So there you go, Isaiah's prophesied... <clears throat> way back then that um, that the gospel would unite people in peace. Um, spiritually now, because they're all one under Christ, and ultimately, obviously, the future, God will bring the kingdom and bring all nations under subjection, under Christ's rule. And then Christ will minister over a worldwide, peaceful um, body. <clears throat> the next one is gospel of salvation. Uh, I've got this one up on the screen here. Ephesians 1, verse 13, it says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed and promised with the promised Holy Spirit. Um, and then if you want to just turn this one up, Acts chapter 13. It talks about Paul and Barnabas. <clears throat> this is Paul and Barnabas speaking. In Acts 13, verse 46. <clears throat> Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. For so hath the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set thee as a light to the Gentiles, that thou shouldest be for salvation unto the ends of the earth. <clears throat> Um, and then Paul later says in, in Romans also that he's not ashamed, you know this passage, of the gospel for it's the power of God to salvation. Um, and why is it the power of God? Because the righteousness of God is revealed um, in the gospel. He says in verse 15, God's righteousness is revealed from faith for faith, as, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So, clearly here we can see it. it's the gospel of salvation because it can save us. It can save our souls. It's our hope in this dark world. Alright, now this one I thought was really interesting. The mystery of the gospel. Um, let's, this, this is an interesting one. Let's turn this one up in Ephesians 6. <clears throat> because 
Because obviously this wasn't understood by people Paul was writing to because he called it the mystery of the gospel. Uh, Ephesians 6 and verse 19. It says, And for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Um, so, what is the mystery of the gospel? Well, I think Paul actually explains this um, further back in Ephesians, in chapter 3, so just turn a few pages back. Chapter 3 and verse 3, um, Paul says, How by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read they may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages has not been made known to the sons of men, as it is now has been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So, <clears throat> Paul says here, he's really emphasizing that this mystery was hidden and was not made known. Um, and But then you can see there in verse 7, or verse 6, maybe not verse 6, um, he says that the Spirit has made it known. The Holy Spirit has revealed this mystery of the Gospel. So, what's so, what is the answer? What is the mystery? Well, in verse 6, <clears throat> Paul says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So that's the mystery that so many of the Jews stumbled over and couldn't get their heads around. Um, because it was so ingrained into them that the Gentiles were unclean and all the rest of it. But Paul says that's the mystery. The Gentiles would be included in God's plan of salvation. Um, when he says it was hidden, it wasn't completely hidden. As we saw, the gospel has been all through the Old Testament. Um, but it wasn't obvious. It was kind of like the parables that Jesus told, right? Um, they had amazing lessons and meaning behind them if people took the time um, to understand them. But it wasn't completely obvious on the surface. I think it's the same with the gospel in the Old Testament. God gave them many hints and symbols and the prophets. He tried to to lead them to it, and some of them definitely got it. We saw many examples of those, Abraham, um, the rest of the ones we talked about, Jeremiah, and, and so on. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of the Jews couldn't see that, whether it was because of the pride of being chosen or whatever. Um, they didn't pick up on it. Um, Jesus, Jesus explains the concept to his disciples when he tells them that he speaks in parables um, because because it is given to them to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. And, and Jesus says that the reason he speaks in parables is because, we won't turn it up in, in Matthew where he goes through it, but the summary of, of that is really that he wanted people to really try and understand what he was saying. He didn't want people just to hear it and you know go in one ear out the other. Um, and he wanted to keep it a mystery from those who had closed their minds to him and who were refusing to accept any um, change in teaching. In fact, they reacted violently when Jesus, when Jesus did try and tell them. Um, we had an example of that in our exhort, actually. Let's just quickly turn this one up. Luke 4, verse 25. <clears throat> Jesus is speaking to them in, in Luke 4, verse 25. And he says, I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land. But Elijah was not sent to any of them except to Zarephath, a city of Sidon, to a woman, a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. And none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. And then verse 28 it says, In hearing these things, all the synagogue were filled with wrath, and they rose up and thrust him outside the city and led him up to the brow of the hill on which their city was built in order to throw him down. Um, so Jesus was trying to get them to see that even back in the time of Elijah and Elisha, God had a plan for the Gentiles. But they were so blind that even though they couldn't argue with what he was saying, because Jesus was just giving them facts from the Bible, they got so angry that they tried to kill him. Um, so I think, you know, let's... Let's hope and pray that we never become that blind because obviously it can happen, right? Um, and it's truly an unreachable situation. So unreachable that in Paul's example, when Jesus, had one, when Jesus converted him, he had to actually like physically knock him to the road and strike him with blindness just to get through to him. 
um, and get that message across. <coughs> okay. Um, and I think this is why Jesus spoke in parables, because he wanted truth, see- see- ser- yeah. truth searchers. <laughs> um, he wanted people who invested time and energy in finding out what was right. This is like the Bereans here in this verse in Acts 17. They received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. That's why I think the gospel was hidden in the Old Testament and why Jesus spoke in parables. Because he wanted us to put effort in. <clears throat> okay. Um, and just quickly, I think what Paul meant when he said that the Holy Spirit revealed the gospel was the account of Cornelius, right? When Peter goes there and the nets let down and Peter's, and then Holy Spirit is poured out upon all the Gentiles there. And Peter and the other um, disciples there are shocked because they can't believe the Gentiles are given the Holy Spirit. But then they come to the realization that God obviously wants them to be a part of salvation and they say, well, who can hinder them to be baptized, right? And they're baptized. Okay, just in the interest of time, we'll quickly skip through these. Um, Some practical points. There's no other gospel. There's only one gospel. So, um, and and Paul gives a thing about um, even if another, even if an angel from heaven preached another gospel, do not follow it. So, some um, stick to what we know and what we've been told. Uh, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Christ died for us. Um, Do we live our lives? in a manner that's worthy of that sacrifice? I mean, I think it's impossible, right, to, to do anything worthy of that. But we have to try our best because Christ gave our life, um, his life for him, for us. <clears throat> uh, preaching, this is another good one, preaching is not an option, it's our duty. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16, Necessity is laid upon me, woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. All right, so in summary then, um, oops, <laughs> there you go. In summary, um, it has been pre- the gospel has been preached from the foundation of the world. Um, it involves judgment, grace, salvation, peace, a kingdom. It's all been given through the name of Jesus Christ, believing on him, and it's our duty to go into all the world and let our light shine um, to as many people in the darkness as possible. Oops.